thank you very much for coming. My paper is an analysis of the introduction of camping in China during the Republican period. It looks into the tensions that surrounded this introduction, while it also seeks to understand them, particularly in the light of Western and Chinese travel cultures, and as manifestations of broader realities and cultural clashes. Camping largely developed in Republican China as an activity that was embraced by the Scout Movement. The Scout Movement gained a foothold in China not long after the creation of the first camp by Baden Powell on Brown Sea Island in 1907. This happened soon after the establishment of the Republic in 1911, with the creation of the first unit of Boy Scouts in 1912 or 1913. The Scout Movement brought along with it to China a travel culture that was centered on its ideological backbone, which was that of preparing the young in body, character, and skills, allowing them ultimately to become strong, healthy, active, and capable citizens who would, through such qualities, be able to help the nation. The pursuit of identical aims to those of the Scout Project had actually been a developing idea in China since the late Qing dynasty within the framework of a perceived need to save the nation. For this reason, among others, scouting found a receptive ground in China, including among uh, educators and schools, and was ultimately appropriated by the ruling power. It came under the control of the Kuomintang in 1926, and was later both promoted and integrated into the educational system for purposes of citizen tra citizenship training and inculcation of party ideology. Scouting was, and this must be emphasized, a significant reality in Republican China, and one that was all the more so important as it came to be promoted by the state. Camping in the open air was one major aspect of the scout travel experience and was mentioned in particular by GSF Camp, who was the chairman of the Shanghai Boy Scouts Association. In an article that was published in 1916 in New Youth. New Youth was a very consequential publication in the early Republican period that was aimed at youngsters and purported to transform China by urging the repudiation of the traditional culture and the embracing of modernity. So GSF Camp mentioned camping in that article of New Youth for the purpose of describing the scout movement in general and in China, and for the purpose of calling for new membership. He said that camping in the open air was, and I quote him, one of the most attractive forms of scouts craft, one in which scouts did all the cooking, washing, and cleaning, and which led to an independent nature. He added that in camps, no coolies were allowed as a rule, a relevant reference considering the importance of coolies at this point in time in the city of Shanghai. With time, scouting became crucial in propagating images of camping as a desirable travel experience. This was all the more so from 1926 as political appropriation of the movement, of the scout movement by the Kuomintang rendered it mainstream and more far-reaching. These images were conveyed, for example, in the illustrated press of the 1920s and the 1930s, where the camping life of boy and girl scouts was shown as convivial and pleasant. And I'm showing you here a few examples, as you can see, uh, of, uh, from the 1920s and the 1930s. The proposal of camping appeared from outside the scouting context too. The YMCA, which was officially established in China in 1895, had organized its first summer camps in the United States in the 1880s 
and organized an international camp in Japan in 1929 that was attended by a delegation from China. News of this international camp uh, appeared in the uh, Chinese press. The Young Magazine, uh, the Young Companion Magazine for one, explained that the aim of the camp had been to put summer holiday time to use while it showed pictures of the activities, as you see here. The YMCA came to organize camps in China as well. It operated an experimental camp to work out camp methods suited to China in 1933, then 10 camps in 1934, and finally the International Fourth Pacific Area Older Boys Camp in August 1935. Against this background, camping gradually emerged as an attractive activity as a recognizable touristic option, most obviously among young people. And its practice was both recounted and recommended. The youth's pictorial magazine, for instance, showed how life was at a summer camp organized by a Beiping Youth Association in its issue of August 1937, just after the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War. Of course, at such a time of conflict, this kind of activity would have seemed all the more important. It is significant also that later, in August 1945, just before the end of the war, Du Li Ren, a university student of the Foreign Relations Department of the Central Politics University in Chongqing, wrote a tourism plan for post-war China which he presented as an essay to the China Traveler magazine, which was the most read travel magazine in Republican China. In the plan, he stated that traveling was one of the most important parts in the education of its citizens. In his view, education authorities should therefore guide schools at all levels so that they might organize the use of holidays for traveling. It was not just through schools that he considered that an orientation should take place from a broad citizen-based concept of education, which did not only rely on schools, he envisaged, envisaged schemes within his plan of social travel for those with no money, as well as, as of large-scale youth travel. These schemes would rely to a certain extent on a network of national parks and he explained the need for them through a set of sporting open air activities such as rowing, skiing and camping. Uh, and he mentioned that the young now would be able to carry these activities in this network of national parks. Very clearly then, he viewed camping as a positive activity related to the open air and to physical activity that was to be promoted. Anyway, the fact is that while camping was the object of attraction among some, as we have seen throughout these references, it was a new activity that was also difficult to understand among many and met with resistance. In an article published in 1931 in the Life Weekly, a traveler reported his one week experience at an apparently non organizational summer camp at Badachu on the outskirts of Beiping. He mentioned that it had been all very new to him and that he had enjoyed, for instance, sleeping in the open air, given the choice between that or sleep, sleeping in a tent. He went on then to explain to readers how summer camps thrived among young Europeans and Americans. He wrote that. When holidays came, they got together, went outdoors, camped, and led a simple primordial life. In contrast, he said, such a practice had not yet become common in China. He gave a reason for that. All those who, and I quote, traveled to avoid the heat, liked to spend their time much like at home, and lacked a feel for the outdoors. His reference to travel to avoid the heat was related to an important element in the tourist culture in China. Avoiding the heat was a major reason for leisure travel in the Republican period, much as it had been for centuries. Traveling to the hills to avoid the heat 
was a firmly rooted concept in China. It had been an established imperial practice. And examples of that are found in the Qing Emperor's trips to the summer palace at Ruhol, which started being built under Kangxi as a hill estate designated to avoid the heat. Some literati had also owned villas in the hills in earlier periods of Chinese history, and in the late Ming, there had been several villas in the suburbs of Beijing near the western hills. This type of leisure practice not only remained popular during the Republican period, but had become more widespread for a variety of reasons that were related to the diffusion of leisure patterns and in particular the existence now of a network of seaside and hill resorts that had been created by foreigners in China since the late Qing period. The exposure outdoors and to the heat that camping could involve was certainly a factor that would have deterred many from trying it. And the author of the article was aware of that. It goes without saying that the novelty and strangeness of this form of leisure experience, which relied on self-sufficiency self and was on nature's terms, may of itself have repelled many potential campers as well. In fact, another aspect of the Chinese traditional travel culture may also have contributed to a reluctance to camp. It was the traditional association in China of travel with discomfort and lack of hygiene. Travel had often been perceived as a difficult, unpleasant experience, both due to the tough conditions of travel and the sense of estrangement which many travelers felt. Chinese literature, for example, was full of references to the dislike of travel. These were to some extent related to the laments of exile, but in many cases, Descriptions of the hardship of travel were far from simple reflections of private woes. Traveling was often an ordeal of its own, and many travelers alluded to the objective difficulties they had experienced in their writings. As a consequence, for both practical and cultural reasons, the notion that travel involved hardship became an ingrained element in Chinese culture much as it was in the Western world as well until the 19th century. This perception was not something that simply vanished with the arrival of the modern period. The fact that travel implied suffering persisted through the last years of the Qing and into the Republican period. In fact, to some extent, this perception may have been exacerbated among some during this period. Much as elsewhere, an obsession with hygiene developed in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in China, with its implications for individual modernity and national advancement and survival. This may only have helped to invigorate the notion of travel and, as hardship and to exacerbate fears of travel among many of the potential or actual travelers. Much of the travel literature of this period, the Republican period, seems to demonstrate this as it revealed a particular concern about hygiene during travel. And just to give an example, uh, a, a manual on travel hygiene emerged in 1916, instructing travelers on how to avoid disease and ill being in different travel situations. Considering all this, it would have been particularly difficult to promote camping which was a demanding type of travel in China, where the hardship of travel was considered a given and was tolerated only under the promise of an established set of physical or intellectual pleasures from travel, which camping did not have on offer. There was one further problem with camping, the great exposure to the elements which it involved. A journalist of the China Traveller wrote an article in 1933 on camping and picnicking. And you can see some pictures here of this article. In this article, he exhorted readers to go to the countryside in summer and build their own tents and camp. But significantly, he needed to dispel fears associated with this exposure. 
He explained, you need not be afraid of the sun. It is the sun that delivers everything in our lives. You need not be afraid of breathing the air from the forest and the land. It is a medical balm which improves people's health. This type of comment was not an isolated one. A writer for the Unison Travel Party Monthly, another travel magazine of this period, presented a similar argument in an article uh, which was uh, also written in 1933. While describing all the advantages of camping life to readers, the author had to explain also that the sun was not to be feared. There was a context to all this. In China, while sunlight had historically enjoyed associations with good health and sunbathing had even emerged as being therapeutic, exposure to the sun had largely been shunned as a result of the traditional ideal of pallid skin as a mark of upper class status and the standard of beauty. In Republican China, new ideas about the importance of sunlight and sunbathing practices were gradually introduced through Western influence. But this was still a surprising thing for many and therefore had to be explained. Given all this, given a travel culture in China that was to an important extent based on the idea of avoiding the heat and on the perception of travel as hardship, and also, given the fact that exposure to the elements was not part of Chinese culture, camping was a concept that needed explaining. It's not surprising, therefore, that a writer for the China Traveler should have emphasized as a groundwork for uh, an article that was published in 1936 on the, and I quote, the in unfamiliar camping life of Americans, it's not surprising that its author should have emphasized that traveling was primarily a pleasant and enjoyable experience, and also that it included the meaning of training body and mind and gaining all types of knowledge. So there was this range of benefits to be gained from it. All these tensions surrounding the introduction of camping in China are relevant not only on their own, but also on a broader scale, as examples of the relevance of modernity in China and of its conflict with tradition. The fact that camping became a reality in China bears testimony to a curiosity about the outside world and an opening up to it that the historiography first focused on this period of Chinese history for a long time neglected, concentrated as it was on a scrutiny of problems and deficiencies in China. It has only more recently begun granting greater recognition to this facet and I wish to uh, insist on that too. At the same time, the reluctance towards camping stands as an example of the limits of modernity in Republican China. Uh, I wish to thank you uh, very much for uh, listening to my presentation. Thank you.